Uh, Luke chapter 8, please turn in your Bibles. Uh, still in the 8th chapter, meaning that's where we were uh, last time. We're still there, and we come today to this uh, familiar account of our Lord stilling, stilling of the sudden storm upon the Sea of Galilee, an event that had a profound effect upon the 12 uh, disciples, a uh, witness by the fact that uh, all three of the synoptic gospel writers include this account. Uh, Luke had his own peculiar style of writing. As an historian, uh, one might have expected him to be a, a stickler for chronological uh, exactness, but th that is often the mark of the tedious storyteller like uh, the husband who habitually takes forever to tell a story, but his loving wife prompts him to get on with it. Uh, well, we see that here a bit as he shifts to his telling of this story in verse 22. It was on one of those days, Luke says. Uh, that's all the context required. But in the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, in verse 35, uh, Mark provides the little detail that what we're about to read took place on the evening of that day in which Jesus uh, taught in parables and that we dealt with our last time uh, together. Uh, Luke, adding only the little incident about his mother and brothers coming to see him and the extreme importance of both hearing God's word and doing it, it would have served the disciples well in the crisis they are about to experience. So it's a short passage, verses 22 through uh, 25. Let's read it now. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. Uh, they came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And I guess the prose probably doesn't do it justice. Uh, if they're perishing, then there was a, a great sense of panic uh, amongst them. So they're uh, Luke summarizes what they were saying. Master, Master, uh, we're perishing. And he got up, Jesus did, and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this? that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I'm sure you've seen, as I have, uh, these advertisements on, on television for uh, money management companies that promote the smooth sailing that affluence and wise investments can assure if we'll only avail ourselves of the services offered by them when we place our resources in their hands. Typically, uh, there is the image of a very nice boat uh, sailing peacefully along the calm surface of some exotic body of water, and you and your spouse, uh, healthy as can be, and with a cocktail typically in your hand, uh, directing your well-tanned visage forward to see what the next what will next appear on your experience of the good life. I doubt any of us are against that sort of reverie or ad adventure uh, in some measure. Uh, there are no storm clouds on the horizon, at least for that moment. Uh, and the thought that the present serenity might not last forever is conveniently cropped out of the picture so as not to spoil the moment. But alas, uh, real life does not afford such a luxury. The storm clouds are beyond the horizon, 
and you will not avoid them. No one will. I speak figuratively, of course. Uh, the calm sea is the respite that our sovereign God allows us by His grace. It is His gift to us, and we may rightly enjoy those times of peace and, and, and beautiful sunsets, but the storm at sea uh, looms figuratively as the trials that inevitably come our way. Like uh, the episode in our scripture reading, uh, most trials come suddenly, a ringing of the phone, uh, a letter in the mail, uh, the lab results in uh, the email from uh, your doctor's office. But we soon learned that the trouble had been building all along, uh, all the hidden uh, background of our smooth sailing. Uh, it was there, and what may have been long in the making arrives with a fierceness that brings us to our knees. And they come to us, ultimately, from our benevolent God. That's a profound thought, uh, but a truth that must be carefully considered and reverently embraced. But its certainty comes out of Luke's description of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples launch out into the water, a, a storm suddenly and precipitously arises, their master is sleeping, but then God awakes and peace prevails. It was an experience the disciples needed. Uh, but still, uh, oh, to be able to see the end uh, while yet being tossed by the waves. Well, Luke describes the start in verse 22. Jesus and his disciples, as usual, had had a long day uh, filled with teaching and the various miracles of mercy the Lord performed as a steady stream of sufferers made their way to him deep into the night according to Matthew chapter 8. And the time had arrived to at last make their way to uh, where they would spend the, the evening. For reasons not expressed, Jesus uh, determined that they would go over to the other side of the lake. And so they launched out as Luke uh, phrases it, uh, unaware of what they were soon to encounter. Uh, the life of a Christian is a continual launch, if you don't mind me jumping right into an application. Uh, day to day brings new experiences, new uh, challenges. Uh, each may begin innocently and unremarkably, uh, but what lies ahead, frankly, as carefully as we may have planned, is known to only one. Uh, when, what will the day's launch bring? The only thing we can truly know is what the final launch will bring. But here in this present launch, as this close-knit crew began their sailing and the rhythm of the waves rocked the boat, Jesus found a comfortable spot and he quickly fell asleep. Uh, that may seem unremarkable uh, enough, but this is the only place in the Gospels in which Jesus is pictured as sleeping. Could there be anything uh, more human, uh, that weary urge that comes upon us when sleep seeks to commandeer your body and depending on the circumstances, you either gladly succumb to it or helpless, helplessly uh, resist it? doesn't just happen in church, uh, though here, here there is fertile ground uh, for that, but it can come at other inopportune times. It happened to me this week in, in a very important meeting with my best client and all these representatives had flown in from different parts of the country and there we were in the conference room and they dimmed the lights. Uh, with the big screen so we could see the presentation and the head guy uh, on virtually about this tall staring at us all in the conference room when suddenly you realize your eyelids are drooping and you're in danger of recklessly falling asleep. It's the most awful feeling. I've talked to some of you about this. It does hit us in, in church, and uh, why? 
I think the devil's in it, but it's, it's a terrible feeling. But mostly, uh, we gladly welcome the onset of sleep because we're human and we need sleep. So I want you to notice, uh, I'm calling these movements, that there's two movements in this one verse, verse uh, 23. Uh, one is the, this, this violent, sudden storm that threatened the disciples. Uh, the other is the Lord Jesus uh, asleep in the stern and remaining asleep as the storm raged. Now Luke informs us of these two movements in the reverse order of that on account of their occurring in that order, but I'd like us to consider them in this way. First, first the storm. He describes it quite simply as a fierce gale of wind that descended on the lake so that the disciples began to be swamped and to be in danger. And judging by their desperate response in the following verse, they were in great danger. Uh, the Sea of Ga Galilee actually is a lake, as Luke describes it, and it's uh, prone to such storms as this because of its physical characteristics. And I understand that several of you have been there and, and, and know this, but it's uh, actually about 600 feet below uh, sea level. Uh, and it's surrounded by mountains. It's really a, a beautiful place. And so, in effect, it, it forms a kind of a, a gorge, uh, creating a funnel effect in which a cold air uh, coming down from the heights is apt to quickly de develop into these furious and windstorms or, or squalls, uh, sweeping down upon the warm, warmer uh, lake waters. It's not exactly the same as uh, the thunderstorms that we have here. Uh, when uh, cold air finally blows in <laughs> and uh, meets up with the warm air, okay, hot uh, air that's here, and we have these great storms, these booming uh, storms. Uh, so, but here this night, it was a particularly violent storm that develops, uh, sweeping huge waves of water into and over the boat so that, it, so that it began to fill up with water and threatened to cause it to sink. Its occupants were made up of quite a few fishermen, so they were not unaccustomed uh, to weather, but this was out of the ordinary, and uh, they resorted to every maneuver they could think of uh, to survive its fury. And then there was the Lord sleeping through the turmoil. Uh, the day had been a long day uh, for him, especially in the weariness and exhaustion that descended upon him overcame him uh, so that he could not resist sleep. Uh, not that he would have attempted it, uh, rather he gave himself over to the rest that his body both physically and emotionally uh, required. And as the storm raged and the disciples uh, desperately fought for survival, uh, Jesus uh, slept uh, the peaceful sleep of one content in his circumstances. Uh, fear was not an emotion we ever observe in the Lord. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, that we never see fear in our Lord. Uh, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, contemplating, anticipating the terrible agony that was to come upon him, he recoiled in apprehension of it, but he didn't fear it because he knew his heavenly father would see him through it. Now you may be thinking, <clears throat> might not it have just been that he was asleep and he was unaware of the danger uh, they were in. And that kind of thinking is, is logical and I, I, it's welcome to think that way because it brings to fore the marvelous mystery of the incarnate Christ. Very God of very God, with all the attributes of belonging to God, including omniscience, knowing everything, but also a true man with true feelings and, and real human limitations. Uh, he who was in the form of God, to, to borrow Paul's uh, phraseology. 
uh, was faint and asleep, and yet at the same time possessing the divine power uh, to still the angry storm by his mere rebuke. And this, so this is the interplay uh, between his humanity and the omnipotence of deity uh, that both equally came to bear upon him. Uh, Alfred Edersheim, who I like to read and often quote here, Edersheim wrote that his humanity appears here as true as when he lay cradled in the manger. Yet in his impending response, he reveals undeniably the divine master, mastery of the created world. Well, over the centuries, uh, as the church's divines attempted to reconcile these two things, Christ's uh, deity and his true humanity, uh, they developed uh, the doctrine eventually uh, called the hypostatic uh, union. Uh, it emerged in its full form out of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD with the assertion these councils would meet in the early centuries of the church uh, to work out uh, the doctrine, to work out the truth, to find the truth, to find the truth that was in the scriptures, uh, to find the truth that Jesus had revealed in, in, in his teaching. And uh, normally these sprang up first from heresy, uh, from false teaching, so they had to come together and search the scriptures and debate, and typically they'd issue an edict or uh, the results of, of their council. And there were several councils, <clears throat> but I'm going to read you the result that they issued. Uh, it is in my notes, right <laughs> here. Here it is. They asserted that the person of Christ was to be acknowledged in two natures, Inconfusedly, inter unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction in the natures being in no wise taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two uh, persons. And that's the most quoted statement from Chalcedon. Uh, many of you know it. And, and the gist of it is this. Uh, Jesus, was, Jesus is God and man in one person. Uh, the et eternal Son of God took upon himself a real and true human nature, uh, the very same as belongs to each of us, yet without sin, uh, God became a true man while retaining his deity according to the teachings of Scripture, though manifestly only one person, and yet unlike you and me, uh, with two natures, uh, making this union also a, a great mystery. And as such, Jesus, the God-man, shares with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, Spirit uh, one usia, that's a Latin term, they use these Latin terms, usia, O-U-S-I-A, one essential being, while each member of the Godhead maintains an individual hypostasis, hypostasis, a personhood. So I'm going to read it without the commentary. Uh, Jesus, the God-man, shares with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, one usia, one essential being, while each member of the Godhead maintains an individual hypostasis or personhood. The hypostatic union, then, is the description of God becoming man in the person of Jesus Christ without relinquishing his divine nature. So when we observe the man, Jesus Christ, asleep on the boat, and, and you just have to marvel at this, this really happened. He was a man just like, uh, he, a human being just like we're human beings. He was on that boat. 
And so when we observe that man asleep on the boat in the midst of this raging storm, and then subsequently the Lord Jesus Christ commanding the storm to cease, we see the hypostatic union unveiled. As Calvin observed, Jesus was asleep in his humanity, but awake in his divinity. Now, being clever, uh, we might suggest that two realities were at play that evening. Uh, one reality was uh, that danger was lurking in the storm, a real danger that threatened the disciples' lives. The other reality is that God owns the storm, and God was in the boat with them. But the disciples uh, were still in the process of grasping all this. That's one of the fascinating things about reading and studying the Gospels is watching the progression of their faith and then coming to the epistles in the New Testament and seeing it uh, in full bloom with Peter, for example. So their fledgling faith at this point was nowhere to be found in such desperate straits. In their misery, they could not know that God's hand was behind even the storm. Like every storm that assaults one of his children, the sovereign Lord was orchestrating every ounce of water inundating the boat, every gust of wind battering the sea and the boat. Uh, James, <clears throat> the half-brother of Jesus, was not on uh, the boat this night, but he would one day endure his own storms and uh, receive the gift of faith so that he had trusted in Jesus himself, and he would be able to write about such trials as this one in the first chapter of his epistle, James chapter 1, verse 3, Consider it all. Joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and, and myriad other blessings that come uh, from that. Well, in these four short verses, uh, Luke mentions, you know, in Bible study, you pay attention to things like this. Four verses, three times he uses the word wind, wind, wind. Uh, perhaps meaning to emphasize that the one who controls the wind is the one working all things together for good in the midst of all of the afflictions we face or will face. The wind belongs to him. The storms belong to him. At the moment, <clears throat> the disciples could not fathom it, but something about Jesus made them go to him, made them exasperated that he had not already helped them in some way made them wonder why he seemed to be oblivious to their danger, why he could be essentially absent in their time of need. And they roused uh, the master from his sleep, shouting, Master, Master, we're perishing. Matthew and Mark give us a little more color. Uh, Save us, they pled. Uh, Don't you care that we're perishing? Uh, their panic could not have been more evident. And so he responded in verse 24. He got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. The simplest of statements, but outlandishly profound. As Yahweh of old had done in the Exodus when he rebuked the waters of the Red Sea and exercised his sovereignty over their boundaries. And as he did with the Jordan River when Joshua brought the people in to conquer uh, the promised uh, land. So by his mere word, Jesus asserted his authority over nature's will and, and stopped the storm in its tracks. I use the word nature in intentionally because we hear so much about nature, old mother nature, and uh, it, it just, it, it, it's, it's irritating uh, <laughs> because uh, the, the, the Lord owns nature. Uh, nature, as we label it, uh, is his instrument to accomplish his perfect will. 
we've been complaining about the heat, and I, I hate it, uh, but uh, it's God's will. He's wielding this heat upon us. And um, so he, he controls nature. Now, if you've been around the sea at all, me, not so much, but uh, when, you know when a storm breaks and the wind ceases, uh, the restless waves don't immediately uh, become still. Uh, it takes some time for the swells to subside and a kind of calm to return. But the language that Luke and the other gospel uh, writers use to describe the effect of Jesus' command indicates that not only did the wind suddenly stop, but the waves became placid instantly. Instantly, as Edersheim again described it, they throbbed into silence and a great calm of rest fell upon the lake. He said, when Christ sleepeth, there is storm. When he waketh, great peace. Then with the immediate crisis uh, behind them, the Lord proceeds to gently admonish them. In verse 25, he, he said to them, where is your faith? It's a question I imagine he even today asks uh, quite frank, frequently. I know he does of me. Oh, you of little faith. Uh, Matthew uh, tells us he said that uh, as well. Uh, like the disciples, uh, who had witnessed the centurion's servant healed, remember? He was desperately ill. Jesus healed him. They'd seen that. Uh, they had had the privilege of, the, uh, of seeing the dead son of the widow of Nain brought to life by Jesus. They had the privilege of the closest association with the Lord and constant exposure to his teaching every day at his side. Like them, we too have experienced the Lord's faithfulness, seeing us through countless trials, answering our prayers in often incomprehensible ways, and gifting to us the similar privilege of a place such as this church, where we may listen to the proclamation of the word of God almost to our heart's content. You, you can't uh, exhaust uh, the opportunities uh, online to hear the word of God proclaimed. And like the disciples, as soon as the next storm arises, our faith begins to vanish uh, from our hearts. But the Lord knew the answer to his question before he asked it, and now in the presence of the supernatural, the disciples' fear and doubt are transformed into wondrous awe. And they became fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him? Jesus commanded the sea, and the sea obeyed him. The winds also, and they obey. He was undeniably their sovereign. The physical world is the servant of Jesus of Nazareth. He is sovereign over the stormy sea and therefore he must be sovereign over all things, even over the circumstances of our lives. He is more than an influence, more than a moral example, not just one of many great men who have lived upon uh, this earth, Plato, Socrates, Churchill. He is the living God, the creator of all things, who sustains all things by the power of his will, and all things animate and inanimate must bow before him at his word. Back in chapter 4, in verse 36, after the Lord had cast the demon out of the man in the synagogue, we, we remember that uh, account, uh, rebuking him there, uh, just as he did the wind and the waves here. Uh, the astonished question the onlookers asked uh, was, what, what is this? Remember, what is this with authority and power 
He commands the unclean spirits and they come out. But now the question has advanced. It's not just what is this, but who is this? Who is this? That's the question that must be answered. It's the question C.S. Lewis challenged his readers with in his famous trilemma statement in Mere Christianity that it simply won't do uh, to answer the question, who then is uh, this, uh, with what Lewis labeled the foolishness of the suggestion that Jesus was merely a great moral teacher and not the divine son as he claimed. And I'm gonna read it, you're so familiar with it, but it fits here uh, perfectly what Lewis said. He, he wrote, that is the one thing we must, must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us, he did not intend to. Great statement, full of truth. Who then is this was the question that erupted out of the disciples' mouth spontaneously. It's not said that anyone offered an answer then, though Peter would later at Caesarea Philippi, and we'll read that soon in the next chapter in verse 20 of chapter 9. But even here, surely, uh, the disciples of Jesus began to understand that with him beside them, there could be no true difficulty, no storm that could overcome them because all belongs to him and all of it can be ours because he came on a mission to save us in a much greater sense even. And even in the storms that do come our way, he is in the boat with us. And I know many of you are going through storms. He is in the boat uh, with you. Some are not here because of the storms they're going through. He is in the boat uh, with them. We may read this account and come to understand his saving them on this stormy night, but why did he allow it in the first place? It's because he has not promised us a life uh, without storms. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ is in the boat with us, the ship becomes an ark. That's the imagery uh, that Peter uh, borrowed from eventually years later in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3 in verse 20. He uses the analogy of Noah's ark to picture how God saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected uh, to him. And today, the very same Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father in heaven, always living to make intercession for us so that wherever we are, He is there with us. He is in the boat with us, and the boat becomes our shelter, our salvation, our peace. And that is the lesson of Jesus commanding the storm. It's the logical conclusion if the omnipotent, loving Lord Jesus has chosen you to be his sailing companion, he will see you through every storm. Let's thank him for that. We are grateful, Lord, uh, that you are our savior, our friend, our helper. Uh, you are our advocate. Uh, you are our adopted uh, brother, or we are your adopted uh, brothers and sisters, uh, thank you uh, for the ultimate uh, deliverance that you have provided for us. We're going to <clears throat> ponder that later uh, this morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We ask that you would bless us then in uh, 
deepen our appreciation uh, for your great love for us, your great sacrifice. We pray your blessings upon uh, the ministry of the word that's coming in the, in the ministry of the word and that you would bless Jeff as he delivers it. Bless each one of us, bless the many needs, the many storms that uh, are occurring even right now uh, in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.